MCU's TV division is hitting the reset button. What does that mean for the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe on the small screen? This week on The Byword, we dive into that topic. The Byword starts now. Ladies and gentle nerds, welcome to episode 169 of the Nerd Byword Podcast. This week in our big talk, we'll be talking about the reset of uh, Marvel's Daredevil Born Again television series and what that means for the larger MCU. But first, as always, it's time for... Oh, I know where this new story is going, Chris, and I do not like it one bit. I chose it just for you um, because we're taking what would have been my news story for our big talk. We're kind of morphing it into that. So you let me, you let me, uh, you let me uh, color outside the lines with the big talk. So I, I chose this news story just for you as a return of that favor. Um, but yeah, so I guess uh, upsetting trends over the past week or so in the news. Uh, First came when Best Buy revealed that they are out of the physical media business for good in 2024. They will no longer sell DVDs, Blu-rays, what have you. Then I also saw another article that said that Walmart, uh, like Target did uh, this past year, will no longer sell physical copies of video games. So not a whole lot to to expound upon on these new stories, but it looks like physical media is going the way of the Dodo to borrow one of your phrases. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, Dave. I was surprised that Best Buy was still in business because we no longer have one uh, in our area. So that was, I was surprised to see Best Buy in the news. Um, I think there's several issues at play, everything being moved towards digital, which is, you know, the, the path that I've taken. I kind of saw the writing on the wall several years ago, um, but then also the Amazon of it all. I think Amazon has put a lot of, uh, stores and competitors out to pasture, especially in the advent of the pandemic and everyone being under quarantine. Um, it's, it's hard out there. Yeah. Uh, so the Amazon of it all is certainly, uh, you know, a factor, but I think the move towards digital is probably had a, a much more significant impact on the sales of physical media. And to a certain extent, the video game one, I understand a lot more than, than Blu-ray DVD. The problem with video games and physical media these days is that what you're getting on the physical media is r- rarely the actual finished game. Um, re- regrettably, uh, the uh, the old Nintendo um, adage that, you know, a... a a uh, bad game uh, if you don't give it enough time it's going to be you know bad forever doesn't apply anymore and now we have all these day one patches and stuff so games really don't get polished very well before they get put on physical media um obviously when you buy a game physical you better expect a day one patch or significant updates throughout the life of the game for quite a while um so i understand certainly that uh you know i'm going to be completely honest with you Maybe I'm just an old guy at this point, but when it comes to DVDs, uh, you are Blu-rays, you are, <laughs> and thank you, thank you, um, and and movies in general, TV shows. I'm sorry, but I don't, I do not trust streaming, and I think we have certainly learned that lesson with the uh, the whole HBO Max Max debacle. Um, you know, when when the acquisition there from uh, you know Discovery happened, and and they started just like unceremoniously dropping stuff from their streaming service. A subscription to a streaming service is not a guarantee in any way, shape, or form that you're going to have access to any given piece of media. So if it is something that you really love and appreciate and want to be able to reconsume at a later point, I don't think there are any guarantees here that you're going to be able to do that unless you own the physical media. Now, some people will say, well, you know, instead of uh, sort of uh, streaming subscriptions, you can also buy digital, and that is all fine and dandy too until you read the fine print and you realize that you are not purchasing, you know, uh, a a copy of a movie in perpetuity for you to use, but rather a license 
uh, to own it digitally. And that license can, in, in fact, be revoked at any time. So technically, you can, you know, purchase a nice big collection of movies on, on Amazon, for example, digital movies. And, and within the license agreement, Amazon at any point can say, yep, no, nope, not anymore, and revoke that license agreement. So if it's a piece of media that is important to you and that is something that you want to reconsume or share with your children or grandchildren at one point, physical media is regrettably the, the only real guarantee that you will have some kind of access to that. Um, and, and, you know, we've seen time and time again stuff coming and going from streaming services. I know, for example, there was a big hoopla just recently in the news, uh, especially given Bruce Willis's declining health that uh, the, his one of his first big breakout roles in the TV show Moonlighting is actually going to be streaming for the first time ever. Now, you, you know, you got to imagine if you've, you know, bought this on physical media at some point, you have it. But if, you know, you were waiting for something like that to stream, you know, good luck with that because it wasn't streaming this entire time. And this will be the first time that will actually be on a streaming service. Um, so I I'm, I'm understand the changing economics of physical media especially with online sales of stuff like you know amazon and the like but i think um as a as consumers we have become way too trusting that it is somehow in the best interest of these companies to keep this kind of stuff available on their streaming service in perpetuity and we're still talking about server space and the like that also costs money and you better believe if, if something declines in streaming numbers that a Netflix and Amazon Prime and a Max, a Paramount Plus, these services will have no compunction of saying this is a waste of server space. We're just going to go ahead and click delete that and not have that available on our streaming service anymore. Um, I would lose my marbles if I didn't have my Farscape DVDs. Like that, that is that is one of the, the seminal science fiction moments in my life. Um, and, and not being able to have that available would, would break my heart. Um, I'll also say that I have about half of Star Trek Deep Space Nine on DVD. Those collections were so expensive, ridiculously expensive, that I couldn't even finish the collection yet. Um, and right now, Star Trek is streaming in a very nice, you know, situation. But there for a while, it was not. And being able to watch Deep Space Nine again was basically impossible. And again, I will say, I do not doubt for a second that that can go away again. Um, so I, I am still a bit of a diehard physical media guy because I just simply do not trust the digital distribution model at this time. And to a lesser extent that applies to games too. How often have we heard news stories of games being delisted on steam or vanishing from the Xbox digital store, uh, only to return later or being, you know, having, having, uh, their soundtrack patched out because the license agreement for certain music expired. You know, these are pretty radical situations, I think, for, for media access. And there is something reassuring as an old geezer that I am, and that you like to call me now, apparently, uh, that I can grab any number of my, my SNES cartridges and pop them in, and the game is there and functional, you know? So, yeah, I'm, I understand the economics of it. I do not trust the digital distribution model in the long term to preserve media. I just don't think preservation is necessarily in the interest of these companies and we are going to lose access. I think our generation in particular and the generation coming up behind us, they're going to learn the hard way that there are things that they really enjoyed watching in their youth. And by the time they're old and gray like me, they will not be able to access it anymore uh, because it's not been released to physical media and the streaming services dropped it because no, not enough people were watching it. And I think that is going to be a, a, a travesty. Yeah, a, a couple of things. I think I'm a bit of an outlier in that I don't I don't really rewatch things. Like I once I see something, I I don't really have an interest. Even some of my favorite things, I I don't typically rewatch things. Um, so I'm I'm a bit of an oddball in that. So wanting to revisit something, so it, it was never a big I a big deal for me to have a physical media uh, collection because I wasn't typically hard set on rewatching something. Um, but I understand, you know, other people's viewpoints and opinions, of course. The, the other thing that I, I want to, <laughs> this is the same group of companies and media producers that have now walked away from SAG after negotiations. So 
the hubris, if you will, of these companies is going to come back to bite them if they're not careful. I'm not advocating for piracy, but this is the age of the internet. So if you want to, you know, go too far in one direction and trying to limit the things, um, keep ramping up your your prices on streaming services because you refuse to negotiate in good faith with your actors. Um, you better be careful. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not advocating for piracy, but the, this, this generation coming up is really creative. I'll tell you that. You know, there was a, I'm going to go a weird direction here, but there was a UK uh, show um, that ended up being like really, really loosely adapted in the United States on the USA network back in the whole like character uh, age of like psych and all that. And the show was called Touching Evil. The UK show is quite good, but the American show is a very different beast. The show lasted for one season, um, ran in 2004, and had some really, really fantastic, uh, some fantastic uh, cast members on there. Uh, Jeffrey Donovan uh, led, led the uh, led the show, and obviously he he came back later with Burn Notice on the USA Network, which was a huge success. Vera Farmiga was on there. Um, Bradley Cooper was on there. Like there were some really really interesting cast members and and the show was was pretty dark for the usa network but very very compelling and so it didn't last past one season but i remember enjoying the show a great deal and many years later i tried to revisit it and it was not streaming anywhere and had never been released to physical media and literally the only way that you were able to try to revisit this show at the time was exactly that was piracy because some people had you know recorded it off a tv when it aired and then you know, dump those files on the internet. And that was literally the only way that you could revisit that show. And I think that that is going to, you know, with physical media on the way out, I think that is going to become a problem. There are going to be underrated, underappreciated shows that fly under the radar that you want to be able to revisit and you will not be able to revisit them. And and that that that's a shame. That's what it is. All right, let's go from a stinker of a news story to one I'm pretty excited about, Dave. I have high hopes, my friend, and that is saying something considering that some of the worst stories I've ever read came from the Marvel Ultimate line. Which is, but yet, it said, also, some of the best ones. Yeah, also some of the best ones. It's a really, it's a, it's a two-edged sword. So we have, uh, as of recording right now, we had New York Comic Con going on. There's been a whole bunch of news stories coming out of that. Uh, one of the big news stories coming from Marvel is, of course, that we're heading towards the relaunch of the Ultimate line at Marvel, uh, which originally uh, launched in like early in the early 2000s, like 2000 even, I think, or 2001, um, with Ultimate Spider-Man by Brian Michael Bendis. That became sort of a, a seminal, you know, retelling of Spider-Man's uh, younger years. And then, you know, we had all sorts of spinoffs out of that, and it became its own cohesive universe and line until certain individuals named Jeff Loeb, uh, kind of ran it into the ground with some really questionable story ideas, sales declined, and ultimately the line ended. And now we're looking at bringing the line back. And it's been interesting because, uh, you know, one um, we've had a, a, a Ultimate Invasion, a miniseries right now, which honestly, uh, you know, didn't really do a whole lot for me. Um, it was okay, but it didn't really seem to be leading to a new Ultimate Universe. I'm very, very curious where this is going. Uh, story-wise, but at New York Comic Con, we got several interesting announcements coming out of this and a press release. So let's go ahead and check that out. Uh, the invasion is over and the Ultimate Universe is assembling. Uh, at Marvel's next big thing panel at New York Comic Con, fans witnessed the birth of the all-new Ultimate Universe. And then, of course, hype, 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 hype. Um, C.B. Sobolski and writer Jonathan Hickman laid out Hickman's ultimate vision for a revolutionary new era of Marvel Comics, including announcements for Ultimate Spider-Man, Ultimate Black Panther, and Ultimate X-Men, all launching early next year. These represent the initial saga set in an all-new Ultimate Realm, making the perfect place for new fans and longtime comic readers to jump in at ground level for the next big chapter of Marvel Comics storytelling fans could get everything they need to know in next month's ultimate universe number one where hickman and artist stefano caselli uh, team up to unleash the full impact of this new age jonathan hickman and brian hitch's ultimate invasion limited series saw the rise of a new pantheon of heroes now see them band together in this special foundational one-shot packed with previews and insight of what's to come 
And then there was a trailer, and then we have solicitations for three series. Uh, the first, Ultimate Spider-Man. Uh, revolutionary writer Jonathan Hickman and acclaimed artist Marco Cicchetto bring you a bold new take on Spider-Man with the debut title of the new line of Ultimate Comics. After the events of Ultimate Invasion, the world needs a hero who will rise up to take on that responsibility. Prepare to be entangled in a web of mystery and excitement as the all-new Ultimate Spider-Man comic redefines the wall crawler for the 21st century. Teasing the series, Hickman said, Ultimate Spider-Man is a book I never thought I'd be writing. It's a bit of a Peter B. Parker situation. Uh, we're definitely have to talk about that. Um, the next one that was announced is Ultimate Black Panther. In the wake of Ultimate Inv Invasion, Konshu and Ra, the force known together as Moon Knight, are seeking to expand their brutal control of the continent of Africa. In response, the lone bulwark against them, the isolated nation of Wakanda, will send forth its champion, its king, the Black Panther. From the creative minds of Brian Hill and Stefano Caselli comes a bold new take on the world of Black Panther and Wakanda. And then we have Ultimate X-Men, which may be the book specifically written for you, Chris. Visionary creator Peach Momoko reinvents mutant kind for the ultimate age. In Japan, when a young student named Hisako Ichiki develops armor powers, she discovered she's a mutant. And she's not the only one. Meet a new generation of mutants filled with original and familiar X-Men characters. Together, they learn what it means to be mutant in the ultimate universe as they explore their emerging powers and the startling ways they connect to folklore, legend, and magic. Um, yeah, so uh, these are coming uh, in early uh, 2024. Ultimate Spider-Man is going to be the first of these, uh, solicited to uh, release on January 10th. Ultimate Black Panther is supposed to come on February 7th. And finally, Ultimate X-Men number one on March 6th. Chris, uh, I'm very interested in your reactions to these uh, and, and the rebirth of the Ultimate Universe, if you will. I'm excited about all of these, honestly. I mean, Ultimate Spider-Man, we've talked at length over 169 episodes about how much we love Ultimate Spider-Man. And as I said before, we this was a news story a couple episodes ago when this was first kind of revealed someone with like the grandiose scope of things with most of his writing, like Hickman writing a street level character is really, really fascinating to me. Um, ultimate black Panther. I did not read the original ultimate black Panther, but I like Brian Hill's work. Um, and then, you know, you get the Egyptology of it all, you know, with uh, Khonshu and raw. I'm, I'm diving back into um, Jed McKay's Moon Knight, which is an absolutely fantastic book. I'm definitely going to nerd commend it when I get more caught up and have more um, context to speak about it. But <clears throat> impeccable, impeccable book. So I'm excited to see kind of the confluence of things there. Um, and then Ultimate X-Men, you absolutely nailed it. I love Peach Momoko's work. Some of the most gorgeous art that happens in comics right now. Um, and then she's also done some like Demon Days I believe it's Demon Day stuff that she's written in like like these alternate universe books, the Else Worlds, if you will, and those have been fantastic. So, getting her to do the cover art, interiors, and the writing uh, responsibilities is just incredible. And those books are super fun. I'm reading White, uh, Walt Simonson's Thor, and just having like one creator, just it's it's their baby. And just letting them do that is such a such a cool thing for me. And then also, like the the tease we got for Ultimate Universe is fascinating. I love I love 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 Hickman's Ultimate Thor, uh, one of one of the really underappreciated runs in the Ultimate Universe. But then, like you see the lineup of Iron Man, Cap, Lady Sif, it looks like, and Doctor Doom. Like I love the way Jonathan Hickman writes Doctor Doom. It's one of my favorite characterizations of any comics character. So I'm, I'm so here for this man. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. It is, it's definitely delivering some things that I find um, interesting, I guess you could say. Uh, I think my first reaction in just looking at like the cover art of things is I'm not a huge fan of the ultimate black Panther design. I think it's a little too busy. I think that that I've, I've seen is, that reaction is, as well. You're not the first person to say that. Yeah, I, I think I think that suit is sort of perfection in a lot of ways. I think Black, Black Panther has such a great look, and adding all of those metal spikes and stuff to it seems just a little. I don't know. 
Um, it's it's that that part is not singing to me. But I have some faith actually in in the writing because there's some interesting stuff being said. Um, uh, the writer of Ultimate Black Panther, Brian Hill, said, My influences range from the history of Black Panther comics to Ryan Coogler's incredible work with the recent films to Frank Herbert's world-building capacity of Dune. Now, I, if you're knew that, to, I knew that was going to catch you. And now, if you're willing to say world-building in the style of Dune, I am definitely going to have to stick my nose into that because especially that first Dune book is just a, is such a special, special science fiction novel. So if you if you are willing to invoke Dune, you know, you're, you, you are setting some pretty high expectations. I'm very interested to see if, if the design doesn't sing for me at the very least, the world building might, um, ultimate X-Men, you know, my, you know, my X-Men, uh, relationship is kind of blase, which means that I'm very, very open to a new take like this, you know, um, I know I remember reading a little bit of ultimate X-Men the first time around and, and feeling very much that it was, too similar in in many ways to to the mainline X Men, you know. At the time, it didn't really feel like sort of a, a bold, you know, new direction or something. So having a singular creator with a singular vision and bringing sort of their own their own thing to it um, is is probably something I am going to be significantly more open to than many other you know people who are super diehard x-men fans perhaps because you know there are sacred cows that people don't want to be changed or touched and i have no sacred cows when it comes to the x-men um momoko said uh in in the press release i'm very careful in delivering the unique x-men mutant elements while still being true to my vision and voice i'm also very proud and surprised that i was given enough freedom to create a brand new x-men character it might not be the normal portrayal of a superhero um, so I, I really like that. I think, you know, giving, giving Momoko all this freedom to really riff, I, I think that that alone is going to fascinate me. The, the one that I'm clearly the most hyped about is Ultimate Spider-Man. Uh, I have high hopes for this one. Um, you know, bringing back an Ultimate Spider-Man title, you know, that they, they need to have their ducks in a row. You know, like, I, I don't think that Marvel is now at the point of hubris where they're going to launch a crappy Ultimate Spider-Man title. I mean, Ultimate Spider-Man, the first time around was, you know, such an influential book, such a trend-setting book, um, really launched the entire Ultimate line. Uh, and then, of course, introduced Miles Morales, which has become a multimedia star character now. I don't think that they're going to go into this half-baked. And I, that, really I don't think they would let... I don't think they would have someone like Hickman on it to do a portion. Something half-baked, yeah. And what I find most interesting is that he says it's a bit of a Peter B. Parker situation. And if if that means we're getting sort of a, an, an older, you know, tending towards middle age kind of hero, um, I think that's really interesting. Did I see something? I, I thought I saw the words middle age somewhere in one of these. There was a, there was a, there's a quote floating around. It's not from this press release of Hickman saying that it is a more middle-aged take on that. Where exactly that quote is from, I don't know, but I keep seeing it pop up all, all over social media. So I, I have not been able to verify the source on that. Um, but he, you know, saying it's a bit of a Peter B. Parker situation. Like, is it Peter Parker? Is it another character? I think the thing that I find really interesting here is if you go back to Ultimate Invasion. There is a scene at the end of the first issue where, where the maker prevents the spider from biting Peter Parker, right? He pre literally prevents Spider-Man from being a thing in this universe that he's trying to mold. And so... And why? May yeah, well, why wouldn't you? Because we know that, you know, at his best, Peter Parker is, you know, the, the most moral... Uh, the most ethical of, of of superheroes, you know, the one that will not go, you know, go along to get along, you know. And there's a lot of in Ultimate Invasion, there's a lot of going along to get in the long kind of stuff. And 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 Peter Parker, at his best, at least, uh, does not do that. Um, and so, I think there's a chance that what they're if they if this is still going to be a version of Peter Parker that we're getting, then what they might be riffing off of here is that he does not get bitten until he's in his middle age. You know, that he actually, you know, this was prevented and then he actually is a new superhero, but he's not a teenage superhero that's new to the job. He's a middle-aged superhero that's new to the job and all the stuff that comes along with that. 
that is a really interesting take if that's what they're going with. And I might be really off base and they're going to do something completely different and it's not even Peter Parker or whatever, right? But I think that's that's a really cool idea. Um, I would like I would like to see that. And I think Peter B. Parker is actually, to me at least, one of the better adaptations of a of Peter Parker that we've seen. I really like that character in the Spider-Verse movies. I think he he's a a natural evolution of Peter Parker in a lot of ways that we don't generally get to see in the comics. And it's not just about like he, you know, he's married and he has a kid, but he's he's at a different stage of his life. And and I think when you have heroes that aren't just all teenagers in the early 20s, you're opening up very different story possibilities. And story possibilities that oftentimes go on mind, you know, like how often do we have to sit here and just admit that we'll never have a Superman or Batman in their forties, probably, you know, like, it's just not going to happen. They, they're kind of stuck perpetually in like their, their uh, early to mid thirties at most. And, and it's, there, there is, there is more there to explore, you know, uh, one of the reasons I always, you know, appreciated, um, the Justice Society book over at DC is because you have that older generation of heroes mentoring the younger ones. And that does have uh, a different vibe when you have heroes that are middle age or beyond. So I have, I have really high hopes for this. I hope, um, I hope that it is as good as it appears to be on the surface. I mean, we don't know a lot yet, but I think ultimate Spider-Man is the one that I'm probably most excited for right now i think it is the best case scenario besides bringing actual ultimate peter parker from the first run back is if they do something like this it is going to feel different and and unique and has a fresh voice and i would love to see that what i'm optimistic about is the ultimate line was always ambitious and it took big swings for all its warts it took big swings and i think um, with um, as troubling as X-Men comics are, for example, right now, with the fall of Krakoa and the impending reset to the quote-unquote status quo. And I swear to God, we're going back to that bleep in school, but whatever. So now I at least have this escapism of the Ultimate Universe, and my hope is they will be just as ambitious as they were 20 years ago but with 20 years of hindsight baked in and 20 years of growth and awareness so we don't get the problematic things that we got from Mark Miller, Jeff Loeb, whoever you want to say. So like I'm 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 ex- I'm excited about that simply because like mainstream 616 comics are a snake eating its own tail. Like this, it is what it is at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you know, it's fair to say that the original ultimate line had a big influence on mainline 616. So if, if this is, you know, innovative and successful, then there could be a healthy dose of backwashing again going on. Um, and maybe maybe mainline Peter Parker will get to grow up a little bit if if this if this middle age take is successful we over in the ultimate still, line. We still have you know who in editorial, and we've said his name a couple times, and that is the limit that I would like to say that man's name. But um, <laughs> he's still in charge, so don't hold your breath. Before we leave this, Dave, I know we didn't make a full story out of DC's work, but I need your reaction to Cowboy Clark. Uh, yeah, it makes me feel feelings, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is what a, that is what a heck of a design. I didn't know how to react to that one. I know that there's a. I think Cowboy Clark is a thirst trap for social media at this point. Um, but I have to say, yeah, I'm, I'm excited, man. I think just all of this weird stuff that they're doing at DC right now. I, I, I tell you, one of the things that I've really appreciated about DC lately is that they do they do take some interesting swings. Um, and and there is a real I think there's a real energy over DC right now that I'm not really feeling from the Marvel titles. Um, they're they're doing a pirate storyline right now with Nightwing, <laughs> Nightwing as a pirate basically, and I'm totally here for it. <laughs> there's just really cool stuff coming out over there. Um, 
and you know we talked a little bit about like when we were talking about new number ones how the flash book maybe it doesn't necessarily click with us but who would have ever thought that they would try to do cosmic horror basically with us with a superhero story now that element two, i dug you know? like i just wish i understood what was going on more like that part was yeah cool. so i think there's I think there's some really cool stuff going on over at DC right now. And just seeing like Superman as a cowboy, like I just want to pick that up. I just want to know what's going on. Yeah. Um, dude, man, Jason Aaron though, on action comics, that kind of blows. My yes. Mind. I, uh, yes, that was the other one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually really excited for that. I love his Thor run. No, so I, ho- I, I'm... I hope that's, I hope it's more like his Thor run, less like his, Avengers and less the Avengers run. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that a lot. Um, but man, Superman is firing in all cylinders right now. He really would have to, uh, pardon my French, but he'd really have to shit the bed to to ruin that right now because it's the Superman line is just really working with a couple of really weird exceptions. I think I just saw something like Superman annou- announcement this morning, Super Sons or something like that. I don't know. I'm just I, riffing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to look. I am a little behind on looking at all the announcements. Alrighty, folks, there you have it. That was a packed nerd news. Let's go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about the MCU television overhaul that is coming, uh, beginning with Daredevil Born Again. Stick around. All right, ladies and gentle people, we are back with this week's And oh boy, oh boy, uh, is there news coming out of the MCU camp that we want to spend a little bit of time talking about. The Hollywood Reporter uh, reported on October 11th that uh, Daredevil, the um, MCU show coming uh, here soon that had been filming for a little while when the writer and then actor strike hit, um, is actually hitting the reset button and that Marvel intends to overhaul its entire TV business based on the fact that what they've seen so far filmed from the new Daredevil show does not seem to work. There's a lot of stuff that we need to delve into here, a lot of moving parts. Um, First, let's go ahead and start simply with this question, Chris. What is your initial reaction just to hearing that they're basically going back to the drawing board with Daredevil Born Again, that they've gotten rid of their writing staff, that they've gotten rid of the rest of the directors for the rest of the season, that they're actively shopping around for new creative talent to basically come come in and, and write the ship, so to speak? I think it's a bold move to... I think for a lot of for a lot of this series adaptation that began with WandaVision a few years ago, I think a lot of what the MCU and Marvel Studios was doing was just relying on past success and past cultural influence. Um and so I think it's it's a long overdue thing to kind of retool and and kind of adapt, but at the same time like the MCU as it stands is revolutionary. We've never seen connected universes. We had never seen connected universes on this grand of a scale than what we got in two thousand starting in 2008. Like no one had ever done it to that extent. Um, and so when the time came to migrate towards a series I think, and there were a lot of growing pangs with the initial MCU. And so like, I'm, I'm interested by so many different things. And I've, I've written a lot of stuff in our shared document as, as spitballing, but I was, I'm, I'm surprised that I think they said, I think the article said about 50% had been filmed of an 18 episode season and they're just scrapping all of it. They, they, they will use some of that footage. Um, but it's just fascinating. I, I was I I'm gonna be real with you. Like I was deeply annoyed by the MCU haters who just continue to hate watch things and they're like dancing on the grave of the MCU like this is going to be the start of this downfall, which I, I don't think it is. Um but it's it's I'm just really fascinated that they're willing to make this bold of a move. Yeah, my reaction to that is exactly that too. And I think um Unlike some people who are, as you said, dancing on the on the grave of the MCU already, I think this is not just 
a bold move, but an incredibly smart move. From what we've been hearing um, in uh, news coverage of you know what's going on with MCU specifically on the, um, let's say on the television side of things, uh, again and again and again, what we keep hearing is that they just keep going <laughs> in filming yeah. whatever they're working on, and then they try to fix any problems that they have in post production. In post, yes. In post, right? And that is like the crappiest way to try to fix something when you know it's not working. So for them to say, look, we got half of a season here and this crap isn't working, we have to retool before they get to post production, you know? When they can still when they can fix it on the writing level, that's smart. You want to know what's fascinating and this might be why they've done this now. Because SAG-AFTRA is still on strike, but the WGA is back to work. So they might be capitalizing on this period of time where the studios are refusing to negotiate or walking away from the negotiation table, what have you. So they might be taking this time to retool the writing aspects so they can kind of hit the ground running when the actors come back to work if and when they finally reach a negotiation uh, agreement. I think that is exactly what's going on here. And it is incredibly smart because you need to punt back to the writers, right? I think if something's not working, the 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 origin point of the story is where you need to start. You know, is the writing working? Um, and, and I know we're not, you know, g- given toxic behavior and everything that, you know, Joss Whedon is not somebody we like to talk about too much these days. But one of the things to remember about that guy is that he got his his real major success in the business as a script doctor, right? And so script doctoring is, is a fascinating thing. You know, a Princess Leia herself, Carrie Fisher, did script doctoring. And what they basically would do is they would say, here's the major action beats. You can't change those. Here are the stunts that we're getting ready for. You can't change that. Here's the basic production design. You can't change that. But within that, what can you do to fix this, you know? And and oftentimes one of the first places they go is to dialogue or rearranging scenes, right? You're still using everything that's on the drawing board, which is why I think it's very possible something like Daredevil Born Again is going to use very similar action beats, right? But it's going to change some of the stuff around uh, the action beats. And that way they're not, you know, having to do redo all that stunt work, for example. Um, but I think that's where you need to punt back to, right? I mean, the smartest projects when they're trying to make a fix they start with a script doctor they bring somebody in to say hey how can you can you punch up this dialogue can you make sure it's internally consistent can you make sure the logic works from scene to scene can you make sure there's no major plot holes you know that's what we're looking at here um and so at the very least that is something that they need to do right and so fixing something in post is such a such a crappy way to try to make something work when you just need to punt back to the writing first of all and make sure that everything is clicking there yeah so my first question i think is dave why do you think marvel and i know that you're the mc of the episode but we're gonna play fast and loose i think <laughs> you know where this is basically an extended nerds nerd news story anyway um why do you think Marvel felt like they didn't need to adapt more to fit a series model? Was that more, you know, where Marvel? Well, first of and... all, I, I, Marvel has lots of hubris. I think we need to fully mm-hmm. admit that. Yeah. Um. There was there was a, a story I read a couple of days ago that basically said that everybody everybody at Marvel, uh, you know, was basically shocked that um, Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantum Mania wasn't this huge. Yes, I read big that screen, as well. Right. And I'm like, and it was guys, similar. It was similar how to DC felt about Batman versus Superman. Yes, and so you know when you when you look at Ant, Ant Man versus uh, Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantum Mania, you know we t- we talked about this movie, we analyzed it, and in, 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 in to a great extent. And I kept coming back in that episode to the same thing over and over again, which was wasted potential. That the emotional beats weren't always you know holding true. That uh, the conclusion was too pat. You know that that they didn't really take their time. That it felt rushed in places, and so they think they have a banger on their hands. I don't think they always, on on an executive level, necessarily question whether what they're doing is working or not. As long as the money keeps flowing, it must be working. Um, surprise, and there is surprise, a little... surprise for executives to feel that way. <laughs> well, yeah, and I, th- and I think there is to a certain extent, um, you know, there has been sort of momentum-based income, I guess, off the MCU in that people generally like the MCU. And so if there's a new product, people will check it out. So 
uh, although there's been qualitatively reviews and fans, there's been more discontent in you know recently with the product. There is still enough momentum behind the franchise to to rake money in. Um, and I think the reason that Daredevil is the place where that changed is because of the incredibly high expectations people are placing on this project on the back of the Netflix series. The Netflix series, for all of its problems as well, I mean, it was not perfect. It was really strong, but it wasn't perfect. Um, it's very, very popular. It's, it's beloved. And and so them knowing that they have to follow this up, they even brought the same actor back to play Daredevil. They brought the same Kingpin back. They understand, I think, to an extent that if they don't, rise to the moment here that this could be the place where the momentum breaks you know you you know pardon my french but don't piss off the netflix daredevil fans basically Th- this is a hallmark of, of quality marvel product and if you make these fans mad you're going to lose a, a chunk of your audience i think and so that's i think that's why the buck stopped there um but as far as like adapting to fit a series model um, I think we have to be really honest there. I don't think there is a series model right now. That was my next think, question, yes. Yeah, I, I think basically that what has happened is that streaming services have tremendously altered how we how we view serialized storytelling. And I don't think necessarily for the better. Um, I don't mind the idea of necessarily of shorter seasons, for example. Producing 22, 24 episodes of a show every year can be difficult. I get all that. But I think the way the storytelling has tended since the age of streaming is that it is not serialized storytelling. It is just a very long movie where they um, just kind of like have cutoff points in between, right? But you could basically take something like Ahsoka, for example, for as much as you and I both enjoyed that. And maybe one of these days we'll get to talk about it in here. Um, Get your... your Get your stuff together, studios, so we can discuss this. <laughs> um, basically, if you would take out the the openings, the credits, the the twenty minutes of, of of logos, and you would just basically take the base story and cut it together, you would have a really long four hour movie, right? But it's not it's not serialized storytelling. I think the same thing holds true for something like Stranger Things on over on Netflix, right? It is. It is not serialization in that each episode is a complete whole, right? Um, Or that each episode tells a story but contributes to a larger arc, as we've seen in the past with with television series. What we have is basically really long movies that they chop up into bite-sized chunks. And I I don't necessarily like that as an approach to serialized storytelling, not as the standard for sure. I think, you know, doing it here and there every once in a while is, is interesting, right? I think that's why WandaVision was so popular. Um, WandaVision was very serialized. It was baked into the premise that every episode was going to represent a different era in um, sitcom history, right? And so there is a degree of serialization there. And then there's the through line, uh, of the overarching story, it felt more like a TV show. Whereas most of the things that the that's MCU how I has feel been about producing, Loki. that's how I feel about Loki, and I think that's why it's successful. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so most of the stuff that the the MCU has been producing for Disney Plus are just basically overlong movies chopped into smaller pieces. Um, and and I think that is not a good model for for television. And, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> I I think. One of the things that you got when you had a television series that ran for, let's say, 20, 22, 24 episodes, what have you, is you oftentimes had arcs, right? But you also had a lot of standalone episodes. And when you are left with a group of characters and these standalone tales that have a sense of completion, you get to know the characters on a very, very different level. Right. I think a lot of these shows that are basically overlong movies are nothing but plot, 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 plot. And there is not enough character moments there for you to learn about the characters, grow with the characters, grow to care about the characters. And I think that's what sort of maintains a a television show over the long term. You know, if you look at something like uh, Smallville. If you look at something like Supernatural, right, there was a degree of serialization. There was a degree of overarching themes. Um, But I think the thing that kept people coming back was less the story and always more so the characters and their love for these characters. And I don't think there are any characters 
in in the MCU necessarily that have been introduced on television that you could say I love this character and I just want to I want to see an episode of them just hanging out, you know? Except, or I except see for Monica Rambeau. <laughs> Monica Rambeau. Monica Rambeau is really an interesting character that was done very dirty, though, by WandaVision. I don't yes. think she got enough out of that show either. I think the closest thing we actually get to that is Miss Marvel. I think Kamala Khan is, is a naturally sort of character that you want to spend more time with, and her family dynamic is really interesting. I could see... Of all the things the MCU has put out, I could see her and her setup work best as an actual traditional television show with, you know, an, an overarching plot, but individual standalone stories mixed in like that. That is the one that feels that, the most like it could be felt, a regular TV show. I think I think the I think it, when Disney plus Marvel or Star Wars, when they do it best, it feels like a comic and Ms. Marvel felt like a comic. That felt like a comic. Uh, Loki feels like a comic for all its silliness. WandaVision felt like a comic book, you know. And there are others that I've enjoyed, but they just they just don't feel like a good fit. Yeah, you know, it's it's weird, man. Because I think just I think the the base setup that they've been running with has not been very good. This article that we we were looking at from Hollywood Reporter also said they never had showrunners or a series bible. They never made they never made a pilot. To kind of sh- to, to kind of test it out, you know, pilots are so important not just because they're the origin point, the first episode basically that people watch. Pilots are much more important because they're proof of concept, right? You you film this thing at a much lower cost than trying to do a whole show. You sit down, you watch this one episode when it's finished, and you're like, it works, or you say it doesn't work, or you say it works a little bit, but this actor's miscast. Maybe we need to trim this role. We need to refilm this part. You know. <sighs> Star Trek, for example, very famously, the original say, Star Trek just show, going to say that had its pilot, and the the executive said it doesn't work, but there's enough here that we think could work. Retool, and that's where we get you know Kirk, Kirk, Sp- uh, Kirk Spock, McCoy yeah, from, that, right? That's, it's, it's that, now there's that relationship. A, there's a trivia night stumper for you. Captain Kirk was not on the pilot for the original yeah. series of Star Trek. Yeah, so. You know, for them to just basically dive in and say, we're just going to make the series, we have no showrunner, we have no Bible, we have no pilot, we don't check to see that it works, that's just bad practice. And I, and I think that's why we've gotten so many middling, um, you know, uh, television shows. I mean, Secret Invasion, right, was like one of the lowest uh, rated ones, I think, as far as like the ratings. And you out. see everything that happened in this variety. It was almost like a tell-all what happened behind the scenes there it's no surprise exactly you know and so what what we're lacking is creative vision there's always mm-hmm. seems to be an executive that is sort of like uh, shepherding i'd say a cohesive show. cohesive vision as well oh yeah um but if you have a showrunner somebody who's whole you know with, with a vision you get something significantly better and again i go back to wandavision i think wandavision is one of the most successful ones of these because it came in with a high concept with a very very clear vision of what they're going to do with the story pun intended clear vision um and i think because of that creatively at the very least that one worked <laughs> the best so my next question was you know as i, I previously stated this is they were one of the first ones to have a connected universe on that scale, and it had its growing pains. Should it have been expected to have similar growing pains with this migration to a series format? I think, I think to an extent, Chris, right? But I don't think, I don't think Do you the think growing the hubris pa- outweighed all of it. Potentially, I also think though that it's not. It's not just that it's a growing pain in 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 transition to the small screen. I don't think. I think the real growing pains come from the fact that television right now doesn't know what it wants to be. You know, I think that's an industry wide problem. And I think, you know, when we have traditional television series, network television series that are still adhering to this, you know, 2022 episode format, and then you have what the streamers are doing, which is, you know, basically overlong movies chopped up into chunks. Nobody's quite sure you know where the future lies with, with which format. Is the traditional format going to outlast this new trend? Is it all just going to be overlong movies now chopped into pieces? And I think they bet in some ways on the wrong horse. I, I've, I've complained about this plenty, but a lot of these shows as being overlong movies, they're too short and at the same time feel like they're too long. 
uh, if that makes sense. They're too short in the sense that we're not getting enough time with these characters, and they're too long in the sense that they have a two-hour movie worth of story that they're stretching over six episodes. You know? That's that's really the problem with how they're making these stories right now. And so, basically, they came in and said, well, we're putting these shows on a streamer, so we're gonna we're going to follow what streamers are doing right now. And I think it was really to the detriment of these properties. If they would have taken, you know, an approach, dude, we're getting Miss Marvel on the big screen here soon, right? And if I wouldn't be a huge fan from the comic books of the character and have written pretty much all her appearances, I don't know how I exi- how excited I would be on the back of the TV show. I mean, she wasn't even in, in like full Miss Marvel suit till what, the last episode? Which is a trope right? that we need to burn. Burn at the stake. <laughs> I hate it. we did that with Daredevil too. We did that with Daredevil. We've had no significant. Yeah, as that was. We've had no significant adventures with her, so she comes to the big screen, and I don't even feel like I really know her. And the point of the TV show is supposed to be that you get more time with these characters, that you get to know them better, and then when they're in a high stakes story on the big screen, you care deeply what happens to them and how they weather these big crises. Right, It'll be an Avengers level movie. I will say this. The first Avengers movie is fine, but when you go back to it now, it doesn't hold up that well. And I think the reason for that in part is that out of those characters in that movie, there were three that we had seen in a movie before, right? Captain America, Iron Man, and Thor. And that was that, was that right? So we had no real sense of Black Widow. We had no sense, real sense of Hawkeye. It was a new Hulk, so the Hulk movie, whether, whether that the, even the applies. Universal, the universal yeah. situation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we didn't really know is that even supposed to be the same Hulk as, as the last well, Hulk and the, we and saw. And the Ruffalo Norton of it all as well. Yes, exactly. And, and so imagine now if if they do this right. Imagine if they would have taken their time to make us really care about all these new characters that they've been introducing. And then we hit an Avengers movie and you have characters that people have been following in the small screen that they care deeply about being put through these incredible paces through the biggest crisis of their lives. And a Miss Marvel is there and a, you know, the, 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 the second Hawkeye is there and she Hulk is there. And we really care about these characters because we've been spending all this time with them. I think the emotional impact of a movie like that could be completely different at this point, but I think that's an opportunity squandered because they're basically still making movies. They're just making them longer and chopping them up into pieces. They're not doing real TV shows. And here's to exactly to your point. Here's why Ahsoka was so important to me, why I had such high standards of it, because Star Wars Rebels, for me, did all the things that you just laid out for those longer, episodic, serialized storytelling. When I saw Ezra Bridger on the screen, and I don't need, I'm not one of those people that needs a live action version. This was just a continuation of that. When I saw Ezra Bridger, I had tears in my eyes. It really meant a lot to me when I saw Ezra Bridger on the screen because I love this character. I care about him. And seeing him, a grown-up, like it felt like a long-lost family member, you know, was returned. Spoilers. <laughs> but I think I think that's something I I think you're absolutely right in that. Now, one of the one of the questions that have come up in, in this discussion between us is whether they have enough I guess, time, real estate, good faith to realign themselves or or if there is a real like superhero fatigue setting in and they won't have enough time to write this ship. What what do you think, Chris? I think I have one of my best friends who after Endgame and the end of the Infinity Saga, which is, you know, a commitment to be a consumer, to go to the movies or watch it, you know, on digital release or home release, what have you. That was a long story. And when that was like the bookend to that, he checked out. Now he's seen a couple of them. I think he saw the third volume of Guardians um, because he had family in town and they wanted to go to the movies. But other than that, he's like, I'm good. It's just an oversaturation. And so I think he is not nerdy. He is not a, a um, you know, a consumer of comic books or anything like that. And so I think he is kind of representative of just like general audiences, perhaps critics who are, you know, all of a sudden kind of fading on Marvel. It's not getting the reviews it it once did. 
I think I think there is some general fatigue of of Marvel. Um, and I can I can say that honestly as a Marvel fan, I can say that honestly. I think. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't see this as like the downfall of the MCU, especially now, you know, where we're still have Sagraf on strike. Um, I think with a character like Daredevil, given the popularity of the character, I think people are going to be willing to wait. But I think this I think this is not a blemish that is just going to be alleviated. I think this is going to leave a scar. And so if Marvel um, does not learn from this experience, I think it can can spell problems in the future. See, I I have a very different take on this. I don't think there's necessarily superhero fatigue. I think there is fatigue for mediocre superhero stories. And I think there's been a ton of those. Middling, middle of the line, nothing really special to captivate you. Um, Perfectly serviceable popcorn flicks, but nothing with a wow factor, if that makes sense, right? And I think that that goes from for for dc probably even more so um but marvel has since you know since endgame basically produced a string of okay content um but nothing really that like shook you to the core as something really special i think the closest we got is probably guardians volume three i think that one that Wakanda, one was Wakanda Forever, Wakanda Forever. and Wakanda for from? Wakanda Forever is fair as well. Wakanda Forever, I think we have to admit, though, as good as the movie is, a lot of the emotional response came from you know the stuff that wasn't on the screen, right? Correct. Um, so, um, but those would be the two that probably resonated. I think that, the I think most that is strongly. an outlier, and I don't think we can include Wakanda Forever in our judgment of the system since post Endgame. I don't think that yes, to include it one way or the other. I agree. I agree. So the closest we got to something that really was resonant was was Guardians Three at that point, right? Uh, but other than that, most of the stuff they've produced was fine, right? There's nothing offensive. I think. I think. Yeah, I I agree with fine. I think there's a lot of overreaction, like oh, this is dog water. This is terrible. Like Eternals, for example, was waylaid uh, critically, um, and I greatly enjoyed that film. I did too. I didn't think it was like, you know, earth shatteringly like reinvent the genre or something. But, I, mm-hmm. you know, that's, I think, the thing that um, comic book, real comic book fans, right? Like people who read comic books regularly yeah. will, will you know, note not every story is the pinnacle of storytelling. Correct. Some stories are just, you know, Spider Man beating up Rhino for the 60th time. Um, but it's competent, think, it's fun, and it's a good superhero story, you know? Do you think audiences got spoiled by the cohesiveness of the infinity saga. And now that that is over, we have to start telling the new story and they just, a lot of people just don't have the patience to start over. What is the new story? That's I think that, I think, is it the multiverse? Is that the thing? I'm assuming, I'm assuming that seems to be the through line, but let's, let's be honest. That's the problem. Um, you can you can restart Prepare yourself. a new volume. It's the, X, it's the X-Men. Prepare yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can start a new volume, right, of the tale, if you will, right? Endgame yeah. was the end of one story, you start a new one. Or maybe but this is things... this whole phase is like a, taking a deep breath. To keep but ready the, for yeah. I I think you can even do that and have some kind of theme or vision that goes through everything and leads to something. And I'm still not sure. Like the thing that we seem to be getting is there's like a couple couple new Avengers movies supposed to come, right? And we're supposed to lead to those Kang Dynasty and and what was it Secret Secret Wars? Um, so you would assume that everything is building towards that, but it doesn't really feel like we're building towards that. There is no very clear through line here. You can't just say, okay, now we're doing the multiverse, but you're really not really you're doing anything with it, right? Um, so the first phase was very cohesive, but at this point, I don't think we have a sense for how what they've been doing leads to this next climax, right? I mean, what exactly did, for example, the Hawkeye show on Disney Plus have to do with the multiverse? Right, so now does that mean uh, everything gave, needs uh, the no, multiverse? No, no. no. I, I rebuke that question because it gave me more uh, flow pew 
as Yelena, so I'm good. <laughs> I, I will say that actually I really like that one. I think it would have been a very, very fun movie on the big screen. It you was, know, with the, I, with the I Christmas totally theme agree. and sort of a, was, di- yes. a die hard vibe, yes. right? It would have been a really, really fun big screen movie. Oh, um, again, something that was just stretched. And I'm sad again. Yeah, I love Bruce Willis, man. He's known for lo- now, Dave. Oh. That sucks. <sighs> okay. So. One of the questions that we've also have to raise here is why is Marvel generally still out outper- outperforming DC? Uh, I have some thoughts. I know you do, Chris. What okay, do you got? So, I I truly don't understand a lot of what DC is doing, and this perpetuating of the death knells of this previous universe when you clearly have the next stage set up. Like we had another article, we could have you know talked about as well and i'll reference it here you had i think it was a deadline article of everything that was going on with aquaman 2 and i don't know what to believe in that i do know that johnny depp and his rabid toxic oh whatever fan base releasing therapy documents from that's disgusting um really made me kind of if if what that said is true about Jason Momoa really broke my heart on someone who I've kind of looked up to, but you know, that's what happens when you idolize celebrities, I guess. Um, the Amber Heard of it all is just a mess. I'm not interested in diving into that court case, but <sighs> the flash underperforming, like, so I'm just confused as to, I'm confused by everything David has left us. <laughs> like we cancel Batgirl, which had a large fan support, but they released Flash with one of the most problematic individuals at its core to a, an absolute dud in every respect. Lost money. And now we are continuing. And I'm kind of looking forward to the Aquaman sequel, but it's still like with that caveat, I'm not sure what they're doing. Maybe that's the reason uh but but i you're you're the expert here so i'm i'm going to con- concede my time uh to to the representative from germany <sighs> well you know i am the biggest dc fanboy there is but we're going to have to we're going to have to face facts Tough for love. the most part hey i did i'm doing for, it now too for the most part dc cinematic outings over recent years have sucked pretty hard i mean I have not, you know, seen Blue Beetle yet, and I'm almost, I'm almost afraid to. I, it underperformed horribly, right? Um, I'm hoping that it's still good, and just audiences are, you know, staying away because they're tired of what DC has built here. Um, but yeah, it's, for the most part, the DC stuff just hasn't been very good. You know, I think that's what it comes down to. Um, and I don't mean to sound unkind here, but it, start, it starts right away again with 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 the Snyder of it all. Man of Steel was middling at best over serious and 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 kind of missed the core of a lot of things that make superman superman batman versus superman was more of that um without leaning into the differences between the two and making superman super dour right and more ba- more batman like than anything else so they just seemed like two two people that are exactly the same trying to beat the snot out of each other the martha of it all you know it felt silly justice league was a mess and although the Snyder Cut is better, it is still not what I would consider a great Justice League movie based on some of my favorite runs on the property. Um, Aquaman, the first one, was kind of a bright spot that was surprisingly fun. Um, the Flash was atrocious, right? The first Wonder Woman was a lot of fun, and then you get to the second Wonder Woman, and it was not very good, regrettably, right? So, so much of the output of DC has been consistently more bad than good, I guess. And because Shazam. of that, let's, I think let's pe- give Shaz- Shazam some love. The even, first, the first even. Shazam was good, and although yes. I was a, a little kinder to the second one than you, we have to admit that one was not nearly as good. So, um, DC has a consistency problem, right? I'm hoping that with this, with the you know new people in charge and the new direction that they're striking and everything, that they'll find their footing now. But we're still waiting, you know, because are, are we strikes going to give, and are we going burning to give them, off old movies. Are we, are we and, going to give them that real estate, the willingness to start over again? 
I think, and, and maybe this is me being a fanboy, I don't know, but I think that if you come to the table and the first real new DC movie is supposed to be Superman Legacy, if you come to the table with a blow it out of the water take on Superman, people will give you the time of day. I, I think I think that people, and I think there's a reason that both cinematic well, you know universes try you know to start with funny? Superman. You know what's funny is you were laying out the ones that were successful. The ones that were good in quality were the lesser known heroes. And the ones that were poorly received by a majority of people are the flagship characters. And so when you get your flagship characters right, I think that lends itself as to the strength of it. I, I totally agree with that. I have I have such high hopes for Superman Legacy. You know, somebody shows up with a with a banger take on Superman. The castings it alone feels the like castings Superman. alone have me excited. Yeah, I mean it that that'll change that'll change the shape of it all. This is very much a, a do-over, right? They started the last cinematic universe with Man of Steel. They started the next one with Superman Legacy, right? This is very much a do-over. And you come to the table with a banger take on Superman, then and people really like it, then the next thing is going to be, I really like that Superman movie. I can't wait to see this Superman interact with Batman or with, with, with Flash or with Wonder Woman or with any number of characters, right? That's your way in. A, a good banger take on Superman is your way in. So I'm hoping that that will change the texture of, of what DC is doing. But Marvel put out a lot of quality movies for a long time before they kind of settled into this middling, you know, popcorn movie machine that they've become. But DC has ne- never had those heights in their recent cinematic outings. I'm still waiting, man, you know? And that's why the, that's why they get their butts kicked at the box office. The DC brand, when it comes to big screen, doesn't, doesn't matter. It, it, it does not inspire confidence. I agree. I don't think... I don't think DC, for the ones that we did enjoy, I don't think they ever had something to the level of Captain America Winter Soldier. I don't oh, think they God, had movie. something. God, it's so good. I don't think they've had something along the lines of an Infinity War or, or Thor Ragnarok. I don't think they've had something like that good. Um, yeah, I think that I think that's and, fair. I think, you know, you just laying it out that like that, like why the Snyder of it all to, just doesn't vibe with me. And this is just personal taste. And in the age where a lot of people are dealing with mental health issues, I go to video games, to movies, to s- television series for an escapism. I'm not, I don't typically pick out dour things because I'm already dealing with stuff. I don't, there's nothing uplifting. I know that the, the symbol stands for hope, but I didn't feel it. I didn't feel that from that movie. Um, and so that's that's just for me why I didn't vibe with any of that. Which brings which brings me to, I think, the, the question, the final question, the one that we really need to figure out, which is can they pull this off, right? If they if they bring in showrunners, if they write a series Bible, if they do a pilot, if they, you know, if they punt back a little bit and try to really focus on a different kind of model of television storytelling, can they pull this off, Chris? I think they can. Um, I'm just interested to see. um, And I think something that definitely needs to be noted uh, before I answer this, before we have our discussion about this, is this is why the WGA went on strike. This is why the WGA fought for all of their rights, for their compensations, because this is why this is happening. This is not because Marvel is all of a sudden getting... Marvel Studios and the company Disney is not all of a sudden getting like this moment of uh, Paul on the road to Damascus or whatever. Like, or oh, I have a life changing uh, experience and I want to do something altruistic. No, this is because the WGA fought their butts off and and struck for so long to get things like this. Um, but I think it's in, what's interesting for me is just not not just the marvel of it all. We talked about this a lot, I, and I said this in our text thread is like Netflix at all has kind of warped the way series are made now, and, and we've talked about the pros and the cons of that. You still have your legacy media companies like CBS and whatnot, but that's not like the standard practice anymore. Like CBS will put out something like Blue Bloods or other serialized like for generally older populaces and demographics 
but for the most part this is how we build a series now and i likened it to like frankenstein's monster and sometimes you put all these disparate parts together and it works like the first season or two of the witcher especially it worked that monster you, you put it together you get the electricity and it comes alive and it works for that something like the bear on hulu which this is not a nerdy thing but you absolutely have to watch that breakneck speed lends itself to like working in a restaurant um and, and things of that nature so i'm really fascinated to see if this does in the case and i think when you and i think i think it will personally i think it will when you're fairly compensating people when you have workers that feel valued uh that feel fairly compensated that feel emboldened to be creative i'm you know speaking for myself when i'm under a boss an administrator that emboldens me i want to work better i want to work harder for them when i feel emboldened so if they truly um have someone with a strong creative vision and they have talented people listen the writing was never the problem with these series dave she hulk the writing is some of the best stuff shouts to our our pal cody ziggler uh whom we adore writing on she hulk and all those people jessica gow like even she hulk had some mess in that in that uh thr article that we're referencing here uh and uh it survived the experience though because i i I think the world of she hulk and i need a second season announced now marvel get it together but um yeah i i think they can because uh when you empower and embolden people to be creative uh and you just let them cook then 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 they could do just that yeah I, i will agree with that and i think this is definitely something they can pull off um I think uh, there is still enough momentum, I think, in the brand that if they start putting out, you know, more quality content that people will come back, you know. And I think that uh, they've already done a few smart things over Disney Plus, like, for example, with Ahsoka, when they started releasing one episode at a time again, right? I like that Disney, you know, is not doing the binge drops. I like how they're doing it. Like it's like nine o'clock, like like Loki's doing this nine o'clock Thursday nights. Ahsoka did the same thing. Like that's such a smart thing. HB, Matt, it was one of the things Max does well is nine p.m. Sunday nights. They release the new episode of whatever their big show is of that quarter. Yeah, and I think that encourages water cooler talk. It encourages discussion. It encourages word of mouth to spread. It it stretches the impact of a show a little bit instead of it being like a blip. You watched it all in one night and it's gone. You know. And I think if they keep that in place and they start putting out better product again, then people will talk, word of mouth will spread. That's what any, all anybody just wants is just really good content from the MCU. And if they do that, I think people will come back. So I'm, I'm hoping that this this is the beginning of a serious shift in in the quality of the product because they're willing to change how they're making the product. Alrighty, folks, there you have it. What are your thoughts on the big shift in the MCU small screen production? What is your take on Daredevil getting retooled and delayed? You can find us on social media at Nerd by Word or individually at that Nerd Dave and at that Nerd Chris. Stick around because after our break, we have our final nerd nightmare of the spoopy season. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, nerds, welcome to the final Nerd Nightmare. And in this week's Nerd Nightmare, we uh, have come full circle. We began this year's Nightmare with The Evil Dead, Sam Raimi's first movie. And we are going to end with Sam Raimi's so far final scary movie, which is, of course, 2009's Drag Me to Hell, starring Alison Lohman and Justin Long. Here is the tagline. Christine Brown, played by Alison Lohman, has a loving boyfriend, played by Justin Long, a great job at a Los Angeles bank. 
but her heavenly life becomes hellish when in an effort to impress her boss, she denies an old woman's request for an extension on her home loan. In retaliation, the crone places a curse on Christine. We have attack of the crones, Chris. You would I was going to say, you would say, one might say we have an attack of a crone. <laughs> <laughs> um, threatening her soul with eternal damnation Christine seeks a psychic's help to break the curse but the price to save her soul may be more than she can pay uh, production budget on the movie was 30 million dollars it had a box office of 90.8 million and uh, Chris that special time has come what is your reaction to uh, drag me to hell so um, first and foremost let me say Homegirl deserved everything she did because I am a cat daddy and what she did to that cat. Hmm. I, I was ready to drag her myself. Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> I said, I, I texted you. I was like, as a cat daddy, fuck this movie. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So it's really funny like now that like I've, I've always heard people say oh that's such a Raimi thing it's such a Raimiism when I was watching Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness oh that's such a Raimi thing and now I'm kind of the 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 picture is getting colored in for me a little bit and I think uh absolutely gross and disgusting things are just a Raimiism like there's so much gross stuff like Oh, I had like a, a stink bug that got in the house while I was watching this movie and it tripped me out. Um, so, yeah. Um, the, uh, another Ramyism is is uh, Christine getting passed over at the beginning for this new guy. That's such a Ramyism. It almost felt like pizza time from Spider-Man 2. Like it's it's such a such a familiar thing. Um Justin Long is such a 2009 casting. <laughs> like he was everywhere 2007 to 2012, I would say. Um, also, why are you on speakerphone? Your girlfriend just walked out of your office. She can clearly hear your problematic conversation with your mom. Like, stop it. Um, I said it was a perfect ending because of, you know, the crimes committed against that poor little kitten. I wanted to take him home and take care of him and nurse him back to health. Um, I needed to take a shower after this movie. It was just gross. Um, I think the the Roma G word tropes are pretty problematic. Um, if we're being completely honest, um, that's something that I di- I was not well informed of a couple of years ago, and then with release of WandaVision, um, I've done my own research and a deep dive. And I think there's a lot of stuff that we can do better in popular media and representation of the Roma people. Um, And, you know, this was made in 2009. So um, that's something that needs to be, you know, brought into, into the uh, discussion. Um, The music, absolutely spellbinding. Absolutely great. I think my favorite thing now that I've seen all three Spider-Man movies I've seen Multiverse of Madness, I've seen Evil Dead, and I've seen now Drag Me to Hell. The, my favorite thing that Sam Raimi does impeccably is build suspense. Jump scares will always get me and all of that, but the way he builds with music, with dread, with the close-ups, uh, I think it's top-notch, and, and you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody who does it better than that. Um, I love the multicultural viewpoints on spirituality. You had... Um, you had Latine, uh, you know, spirituality, obviously Catholicism probably invoked in there. Um, you had uh, a guy of Southeast Asian descent. And so you had um, those spiritual aspects as well. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I, I overall enjoyed this. Um, it was a little bit uh, deeply unserious, um, <laughs> which is something that I, I've, I've seen with you know, I think I think Raimi is famous for horror comedy with the Evil Dead and everything. So there was a little bit of goofiness when the Lamia kind of embodied the assistant there. Um, I texted you. I was scrolling through my feed and there was a marketplace listing of an old woman selling her rings on her wrinkled hand. And I like threw my phone because I was like, no, she's coming back. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this one overall more than I thought I would. Um, you know, with a with a with a very 
strong title like drag me to hell i was like okay let me prepare myself but i think it was really smartly done um and absolutely achieved its objectives of creeping me out yeah i'm a, I'm a big fan of sam raimi when he makes horror movies i think he makes a lot of movies really well but i think uh he he kind of dovetailed a bit into like just really strong mainstream hollywood stuff right at one point in his career and i think he would have he he could have been like one of the great influences on modern horror cinema if he would have done a few more of these you know um because you are right he's a, he's fantastic at building suspense but he is also he doesn't take himself too seriously so there is sort of a weird joy in watching a lot of his movies and that one moment you can be scared one moment you can be grossed out and the next moment you're laughing your butt off mm -hmm. um i'm thinking like the the thing with the goat for example during that seance you tricked me <laughs> i laughed so hard at the time the first time i saw that i thought i was going to fall out of my seat and then the struggle in the car with the crone yes and her teeth and her teeth fall out <laughs> yeah it was simultaneously it gross and funny like why am i gross yeah yeah and laughing? there's yes and, and i think he straddles those tones so well um you know I, I talked a little bit about how the most recent new evil dead movie was too almost too much for me right it was it was too real too gross um and and i had no joy in watching the movie i like to have a you know fun being scared when i'm watching a scary movie i guess and and sam raimi is just right in that sweet spot where he can make you tense and he can scare you and then he can release that tension with a well-placed laugh and then you just you you're finding joy in being scared if that makes sense right it's like riding a roller coaster and and those to me are the best scary movies and that's one of the reasons i appreciate a movie like drag me to hell so much and i wish just i really sincerely wish that raimi would have done a few more horror movies <laughs> like if he would come back and then direct another one i would probably be first in line to watch it because i really like how he approaches the genre i think the cast is really strong in this movie as well i want to make sure i say that before we end up or before we wrap here i think allison loman who i've never seen before i don't think uh, maybe i've seen her in something else i thought she absolutely carried this really 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 well um Justin Long is that milk toast kind of doofus. <laughs> so he's perfect there. Um, a, shouts to Dilip Rao, who Inception was that seminal movie for me in this time period. And so seeing him again was was a joy. And then the guy who played uh, Justin Long's dad, I remember that was a deep cut. I remember him from the 90s heyday of Blank Check and Richie Rich. So that was oh yeah, that was a yeah. throwback. I love I love those movies, um, but yeah, I really really enjoyed this one. And you know, it is an, it is in some respect at least an interesting meditation of how far you're willing to go, how far anybody's willing to go to save themselves, right? Um, and the fact that she does all these pretty horrific things in order to save her soul, and then ultimately, spoilers, uh, it's not successful, right? Is 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 really really fascinating. And makes you exactly like you said. Makes you almost feel that's, like this is that, a, this, this diner, is deserved, right? That diner scene was incredible, incredible because she almost passes the buck to this elderly man, but then she sees like that he still has his wife and like still has like happiness even in those moments of the twilight of his life, and so she's like, "Well, crap, I can't do that." And then she immediately, of course, calls the one person like you think is is this horrible horrible co-worker but then he gives her some sob story and she falls for it i'm like girl if you don't give him that button except plot twist it wasn't actually the button yeah uh yeah I th and then that was an incredible impeccable ending I th nailed it i remember when, when seeing that ending on the on the big screen and i was like the heck just happened she lost this is how we're going like i i i appreciated that ending as well yeah it's really cool all righty, folks, there you have it. That was it for episode 169 of the Nerd Byward podcast and also the end of this year's Nerd Nightmare. And Chris has survived Woo! another round. <laughs> Next week, we're going to be back with Nerd Commendations once again. We've both done some reading, so we should have some Nerd Commendations for you. Um, if you like what you just heard, get on your favorite podcasting platform. Give us a rating and review and subscribe so you never miss another episode. Uh, we are wherever podcasts can be found, as well as our very own spiffy uh, website, nerdbyword.com. And you can find us across all the 
wasteland that is social media at nerd by word on select ones okay twix at that nerd dave and that nerd chris uh but as always stay well and stay nerdy the nerd by word is written and produced by chris and dave two nerds with a love of all things pop culture the podcast features music by al Jimenez, with additional drops composed by joe biondi our show art is by ashery design Find us at nerdbyword.com and wherever podcasts are available. Mm-hmm.